Euh, je vous laisse euh, accueillir Roberta Metzola, qu'on peut applaudir la présidente du Parlement européen. C'est avec vraiment un énorme plaisir que je donne l'accueil de la part de l'Institut Jacques Delors à la présidente du Parlement européen. Je suis vraiment ravi, Roberta, de t'avoir ici avec nous pour plusieurs raisons. Première raison, cette conférence, c'est la conférence Jacques Delors. Et d'ici, nous saluons dans sa maison du quartier latin de Paris, Jacques Delors, qui nous suit et qui est toujours avec nous, qui nous aide toujours. Et je suis témoin de ça depuis six ans, président de l'Institut Jacques Delors. J'ai la chance unique, et j'ai eu la chance unique dans cette période, de pouvoir, quelques après-midi, les passer chez lui, à son habitation, entendre sa voix toujours positive, optimiste sur l'avenir de l'Europe. Donc nous le saluons d'ici avec vraiment l'hommage à le grand homme que Jacques Delors est, à ce qu'il a fait pour l'Europe et la voie qu'il continue à laisser avec une cadence naturellement moins fréquente, mais en disant toujours des choses qui sont exceptionnellement fortes, comme la voie qu'à la fin du mois de mars de 2020, sa dernière euh, allocution préoccupée sur une Europe qui manquait de solidarité à l'époque, et puis euh, Next Generation EU qui a pris euh, lieu, et ça a été quelque chose d'exceptionnel. Euh, L'Institut Jacques Delors a, euh, depuis quelques années, son académie, Académie Notre Europe, euh, qui euh, marche, et marche d'une façon euh, vraiment grâce à Sofia Fernandez, grâce à la directrice qu'on a déjà remercié et, et, et qui a été pendant ces années, euh, qui est la deuxième directrice de l'Académie. La première, je la salue, a été Imola Streo, de nationalité hongroise, qui est enseignante à Sciences Po et qui a fait démarrer le début de cette vie de l'Académie. L'Académie est un lieu fantastique, fondamental, dans lequel des jeunes européens font un parcours. Et ce parcours, à la fin de chaque année, se termine avec la possibilité de créer de plus en plus cette communauté de jeunes Beaucoup d'entre eux sont restés travailler avec l'Institut ou avec d'autres institutions européennes. Et c'est quelque chose qui est top parce que ça se lie avec d'autres initiatives semblables qui ont commencé à avoir lieu, qui ont lieu à Rome, en Italie, mais aussi aujourd'hui à Barcelone. À Budapest, on a créé avant le Covid et on a continué en hybride. On va reprendre la Budapest European Agora, tout un travail de jeunes engagés dans l'Europe. Mais il y a aussi une autre raison pour laquelle je suis vraiment ravi que tu sois là, c'est-à-dire qu'un des grands moments de l'Institut a été, euh, il y a quelque temps, tout de suite avant le Covid, le mois de décembre avant le Covid, il venait d'être élu président du Parlement européen Évidemment, je parle de ton prédécesseur, David Sassoli, qui était un ami personnel et un grand Européen, quelqu'un qui a changé l'histoire de l'Europe et quelqu'un qui t'a passé son témoin. Et tu sais très bien combien la relation entre vous et le fait que ce que tu es en train de faire est tellement dans la continuité du travail pro-européen et en condition de donner la force au Parlement que David Sassouli avait donné pendant sa période de président du Parlement européen. Aujourd'hui, tu es là. Et tu continues son travail. Cette promotion de l'Académie a décidé de s'appeler la promotion de David Sassouli. Je pense que c'est un choix dont je vous remercie tous et toutes pour le choix que vous avez fait. Et, et je pense que euh, Sassoli regarde, euh, David regarde ton travail avec euh, vraiment la joie de voir combien le rôle du Parlement est en train de monter en puissance. 
ce rôle de Parlement qui est devenu vraiment historique dans les yeux du monde entier, comme je disais auparavant, avec ta présence physique à Kiev, avec le courage que tu as démontré et l'enjeu politique qui était lié à ça. Mais aussi le Parlement européen qui a pris des décisions tellement importantes, le vote en faveur des listes transnationales, le choix pour l'ouverture de la Convention européenne, le choix important sur Fit for 55, donc le choix en faveur des euh, initiatives contre le réchauffement euh, climatique, le Parlement européen protagoniste de la vie européenne. C'est ce que nous, on veut, ce que l'Institut Jacques Delors a toujours euh, trouvé la façon de pousser. On a travaillé pendant ces années, grâce aussi au travail de, des vice-présidentes de l'Institut, Christine Verger, qui est euh, avec nous aujourd'hui, avec un, un observatoire euh, qui a toujours travaillé pour faire en sorte que l'Institut puisse aider, euh, puisse aider le Parlement, la politique européenne. Et on veut continuer ainsi, et on veut continuer dans cette direction. Et on sait que grâce à toi, euh, ce combat va trouver des nouvelles batailles positives qu'on va euh, gagner. C'est pour ça que nous sommes ravis que tu sois là, c'est pour ça que je te donne tout de suite, vraiment avec joie, la parole. C'est pour ça qu'après euh, ton intervention, tu auras la possibilité d'échanger avec euh, les participants euh, de l'Académie, avec euh, ceux qui sont là. Évidemment, euh, tu as aussi en live stream une euh, audience, audience beaucoup plus importante et beaucoup plus large. Mais là, tu as des jeunes qui ont choisi l'Europe, qui ont fait un parcours pendant toute cette année année compliquée, parce que ça a commencé avec encore la phase Covid aiguë, mais qui ont fait un travail et qui sont prêts aujourd'hui pour devenir de plus en plus des dirigeants européens qui veulent faire en sorte que ce combat européen soit de plus en plus fort. Donc, Roberta, merci, vraiment merci pour ta présence ici. Quand je t'ai demandé de venir là, j'étais... Je savais que la date n'est pas la meilleure, parce que dans la vie européenne, on est ici beaucoup de personnes qui savent que la fin du mois de juin n'est pas le moment le meilleur, normalement. Robert, on sait quelque chose de plus. La fin du mois de juin est toujours un moment terrible pour la vie européenne, parce qu'il est à la fin d'une présidence. Il y a le passage à la présidence qui entre vendredi prochain. Donc, il y a vraiment, c est, c est, c est, tout est vraiment très chargé. Mais le fait que tu aies dit tout de suite, oui, que tu sois là aujourd'hui, que tu donnes ce message aux jeunes de l'Académie euh, Notre-Rome, que tu donnes ce message à Jacques Delors en personne, dans la pensée de Jacques Delors, le futur de l'Europe, à nous tous, c'est franchement quelque chose de très important pour nous tous. L'équipe de l'Institut, euh, dirigée par Sébastien Maillard à mes côtés avec notre conseil d'administration qui est présent ici avec beaucoup de ses membres. Demain matin, on va avoir la réunion pour clôturer notre semestre, nous aussi. Et, et, et vraiment, merci pour être là. Ta réponse tout de suite positive démontre ce que tu es, ce que tu penses et le fait que les prochaines années de ta présidence du Parlement européen vont être des années pro-européennes importantes qui vont changer la donne et qui font transformer l'Europe. Roberta, à toi la parole. Merci, euh, cher président, euh, cher Enrico. Quand j'ai reçu euh, votre invitation, je ne pouvais, pouvais pas dire non, parce que moi, euh, j'ai agrandi sans, dans, avec cet espoir quand il y avait le, la discussion dans mon pays euh, ou d'entrer de dans l'Europe ou de rester dehors. Euh, pour ma génération, il n'y avait pas de choix. Euh, moi, j'ai fait beaucoup des années, beaucoup des activités euh, pour euh, choisir d'entrer de dans un groupe euh, de pays qui a fait de toutes nos vies euh, une transformation inexplicable à ce moment-là, mais aujourd'hui, ça que nous prenons comme garantie, euh, comme on voit dans l'Europe, euh, les pays, euh, de quoi je vais parler dans mon discours, euh, n'est pas toujours, euh, et ne peut pas toujours 
être pris comme, comme d'office. Alors, cher euh, rep représentant de l'Institut Jacques Delors, euh, mesdames et messieurs, chers Européens, euh, je vous remercie de m'avoir invité aujourd'hui. Le sujet d'aujourd'hui fait l'objet de discussions depuis plusieurs décennies. Euh, L'Institut Jacques Delors a joué un rôle central dans l'évolution de ce débat, comme vous avez dit, euh, cher Enrico, aussi maintenant. Euh, ces contributions se sont euh, appuyées sur le travail d'experts, euh, ajoutant des facettes supplémentaires à la conception riche et complexe dans ce que l'on appelle aujourd'hui la mode de vie européen. Et pourtant, euh, lors, euh, lorsque les chars de Poutine sont entrés en Ukraine le 24 février, le, dé le débat a pris un euh, tout autre réalité. I stand here representing the lost generation of the European Union to vaguely remember a world when democracy was constantly under threat. Anybody younger than me uh, knows only peace. Putin's war on Ukraine has been a wake-up call on what I would say is the failure of our collective memory. We had grown so comfortable with the idea of a free and democratic Europe that we had forgotten that there are some, including on our borders, that think that there shouldn't be a future for democracy at all. Our collective judgment as a response to growing interdependence between the world's nations, whether that relates to our economies, our climate ambitions, or even the provision of energy supplies. This has been clouded by naivety. A naivety that led us to believe that Europe's way of conducting business through dialogue and exchange would naturally extend to our hostile neighbors. Now, the warning signs were there. The Baltic countries, Finland, Poland, have been warning us for years. We saw the backsliding of democracy in Russia, hybrid attacks on our democratic processes, what happened in Crimea, what they did to Navalny, how they tried to crush democracy in Belarus, And yet when Putin's revisionist ideology was matched by his army, we let it be surprising. It should not have been surprising. Ukraine and its people have been battling a brutal and illegal war now for 129 days, excruciating days. As Russian bombs continue to kill indiscriminately, as the Russian army continues to rape Ukrainian women, as millions of Ukrainians have fled their country and will continue to do so, Ukraine is today looking to Europe for support. And they look to us, and this is a question that we must ask ourselves and the responsibility that we grant ourselves. They look to us because they are not only fighting for their homeland, they are not fighting for their homes, but they are fighting to preserve the values that underpin our way of life. When we talk about freedom, when we talk about democracy, when we talk about the rule of law, these are not words that can be just cast aside when it no longer suits us. We have maybe done that because we took them for granted. But Ukrainians today know, and they've known for a long time, perhaps even before we could admit it to ourselves, that our European project is the largest force that stands in the way of Putin's revisionist past, of spheres of influence, vassal states, and an Iron Curtain. So on the 24th of February, we woke up belatedly, to the realization 
that Ukraine's fight is Europe's fight. So last week, when the European Council took an unprecedented decision to grant EU status to Ukraine and also to Moldova, this has become a watershed moment for European integration. I remember when we were, I was a law student, uh, and it was at the time when the Nice Treaty came into power, first uh, June 2003. I had the, our European law exam was on that day. So we all expected a question in the exam. Uh, what are the changes that will be brought about by this treaty? And then again, when I was doing my, uh, my master's in European law, same question, what, what, would, what would we be discussing? But in both exams, there was the one question. When you look back, what do you think will be in the history books on European law in 10, 20 years? I think we should ask that question today. And I have no doubt that what happened last week, which was not at all taken for granted, or even if I think not only back to uh, January when I started uh, my mandate, but even to five, six weeks ago, I would not have thought that Ukraine and Moldova would today be candidate countries of the European Union. Why did we need to do that? And I was around that table last week in the European Council. Again, I thought that this would be something that would be more difficult to get through. In the end, there was an understanding immediately around that table that we needed to prove to Ukraine, to Europe, to our citizens as elected representatives, but also to the world, that no decision is too difficult to take when our values are being called into question. And if we see that and address it whenever we have crucial moments like this and not focus on what divides us and not take the instinct like we did at the beginning of the COVID pandemic of closing the borders after years of trying to open them as though we thought a virus would stop at the police border check. But that was an instinct that we took. And then it took us months to say, no, Europe is needed. When we talk about where the gaps are, we filled those gaps with unity and in more integrated uh, development and policy making. Because this show of unity, as it strengthened us during the pandemic, has now strengthened us in terms of our geopolitical security situation, and it has also strengthened Ukraine and every country that looks to Europe as that bastion of protection and democracy that it has always was. The next steps will be crucial and difficult, very difficult. War fatigue will inevitably set in. But this is where it is our responsibility to ensure that we do not become complacent. And this is why we must double down on our efforts to support Ukraine, while also taking stock of this fundamental shift in geopolitics. And this is why we must look at the way that we engage with autocrats and where we should change the way we engage with them. Because our founding mothers and fathers work too hard to forge a system to make any return to the horrors of war impossible. It is up to us to defend the rules and values-based order that we stand for. And that means that we need to cement an interdependent relationship between nations and people who are proud of their differences, but at the same time who understand that in this new world, the future can only be forged if we are together. And that means that we have to understand that interdependence is inevitable and that we also need to grasp our responsibility in international fora 
The responsibility is on us. We can no longer, as Europe, say somebody else can do that. If something happens in the world, another continent, another power can come in. Because what we have seen is that either that other power didn't come in, or any other irresponsible or unpredictable or autocratic powers come in with malign, malign uh, thoughts and ideas as to what they can do with countries that are waiting to join the European Union and have been waiting for decades, even though they've been promised year in, year out, elections have been fought and lost on this in those countries that the door would be open to them. So the onus is on us, the responsibility is on us to define the rules, principles and values that underline the way that we engage with other nations and the way those other nations engage with us. Because if it is not us, it will be somebody else. As Jacques Delors himself famously put it 30 years ago, if we are to resist the forces of fragmentation, protectionism, and exclusion, we must be more than just aware of our interdependence. We must move on and manage it, setting common objectives and applying common rules. So ladies and gentlemen, a new paradigm must set in whereby the European Union must own and shape its own destiny, irrespective of the threat to our East. We must be ambitious enough and courageous enough to develop a long-term strategy, one that enables us to take a quantum leap to protect our values. And that unity that we have exhibited as a union and beyond must remain our blueprint going forward. Nous ne devons jamais oublier le pouvoir qui a l'Europe de transformer des pays et des vies. Notre projet de paix européen est peut-être imparfait, mais l'a inspiré et a permis d'obtenir des changements que beaucoup pensaient imposs impossibles. Au fond, notre Europe, c'est une question d'espoir, l'espoir en l'avenir, l'espoir de voir nos libertés prévaloir et l'espoir d'avancer et d'inspirer le changement. Je sais que nous pouvons encore avancer et je sais que nous pouvons encore inspirer. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Roberta Metzola. Donc on, a, on a pu constater que vous parliez très bien français. On a une petite demi-heure d'échange avec la salle maintenant. Euh, donc des questions dans la salle, des micros vont circuler. Euh, -ce y a des... donc vous, les, les questions peuvent être posées en français, ça ne posera pas de problème. Et puis euh, vous nous répondrez euh, comme vous voulez. Est-ce qu'il y a déjà une première question Est-ce que des gens se signalent <rire> bonjour Madame Metzola, bonjour Messieurs, bonjour Mesdames les conférenciers et les conférencières. Je sais que vous êtes d'origine maltaise, vous avez évolué dans la vie politique maltaise et je, je voulais savoir quels étaient selon vous l'avenir des relations entre la France et Malte, comment resserrer ces liens qui peuvent être porteurs de culture pour la jeunesse française et maltaise Alors, mon français n'est pas parfait, okay, mais j'essaie je, je, à répondre en français. Quand je perds un mot, je, je, change, je, je vais parler, je continue en, en anglais. Et alors, euh, moi, j'ai étudié ici. J'ai choisi euh, la faculté de, 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 de droit euh, à l'Université de Rennes <rire> en 2002, euh, deux années avant que mon pays... Euh, euh, est devenu membre de l'Union européenne. Je n'ai pas étudié beaucoup, hein, mais 
j'ai <rire> commencé à aimer la langue française et parler et travailler quand je, je suis allée comme jeune euh, diplomate à Bruxelles euh, en 2004 euh, pour travailler dans cette langue. Euh, il y a beaucoup de relations euh, entre mon pays et, et la France. Il y a beaucoup de Français qui habitent <rire> dans mon pays. Euh, et il y a aussi euh, beaucoup d'échanges culturels. Euh, J'espérais que la, la, I, I would have hoped that more people would study French today uh, in, uh, in my country, not enough to it. But I can tell you that um, the history and the relations, both from a diplomatic point of view and from an educational and cultural point of view, are very, very strong. Uh, I think they could be stronger. The tendency is for Malta and Italy to be, to be closer together. Um, but I uh, chose France growing up because I knew that this is where being a true European could really very much be lived. Uh, and I continue to believe in that. Uh, and I continue to think that that could be further strengthened. Culture is often overlooked. Uh, let's not underestimate that when we talk about united in diversity and how we are unique, how we bring together uh, our visions and inspirations and aspirations, it's also through culture. And we don't focus enough on culture. We also overlook the fact that sometimes the easiest place to start cutting from a budgetary point of view is in these areas and you underestimate the impact that that can have on people and that can have on the true belief in European Union being a union of different countries and different uh, uh, and, 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 and the possibilities are endless. So my, in fact, this year, uh, because it's the European Year of the Youth, 2022, we are moving now from the French presidency, which has been a very successful presidency in my, in my opinion. I understand you had Clément Bon before. Uh, there are still a few days left, and I can tell you many last-minute negotiations are taking place on many leg legislative packages uh, where the Parliament is, on, uh, is, is at the table with the Council. Uh, but this also needs to lead to make sure that we do not, the minute we think we need to save somewhere, we save in culture or programs that would help young people become more European, if I can call it that, after two very difficult years. Merci. Euh, une autre question dans la salle, oui, au milieu, là. Alors, le micro est peut-être ailleurs, voilà, il est sur le côté. Oui, bonjour, David Kahn, Fédéral Europe. Um, regarding the future uh, integration of Ukraine in the European Union, we all know that uh, European countries have a mutual defense agreement, and this could be a problem with uh, Russia, as Russia, for good or bad reasons, considers Ukraine to be part of its uh, sphere of influence or even territory. Wouldn't have it been more uh, efficient and, and better to propose another form of uh, association to Ukraine, some form already existed. And wouldn't it be more important to provide Ukraine with decisive weapons, such as uh, fighter planes, tanks, long-range anti-aircraft uh, missiles, than promising a future integration that would likely not uh, be, uh, uh, would not uh, come into effect? Thank you. Well, thank you for this question. I'll start with the latter part. Uh, could we have been more efficient in, in supplying weapons and defense? Yes. It took us too long to react at the beginning. But at the same time, Putin thought that he could take over Kiev in five days. Uh, and they are showing us that, not only have they shown us that they did not manage that, uh, although what we have seen uh, in the last couple of days are war crimes, pure and simple. Uh, sh is testament to the 
spirited bravery and resilience of the Ukrainians in protecting their territory. When I visited Kiev on the 1st of April, that was the day before the horrific images from, of Bucha emerged. So the discussion on that day was still about what level of integration is possible. President Zelensky told me 97% of Ukrainians want to join the European Union. The decision has been taken not to join the NATO alliance. Another gross miscalculation of Putin is that he thought that with his action, and when I said in my speech that the alarm bell should have been triggered earlier and we looked away, is because we thought that what he did in 08, 2008 and 2015 would not be repeated. And make no mistake, he will not stop here. So his gross miscalculation of thinking that this would stop the NATO expansion has led to countries that till today are constitutionally neutral to enter NATO. Uh, also something that would not have been possible six months ago. And I think what has really changed that is that whereas before you had, before the 24th of February, and I really want to, to use that date as also the point at which the way decisions in Europe are taken, is that before the decisions would be taken at the European Council level, leadership level, and then explained to the citizens. This is what we decided, many different versions of what was decided, and then explained. What I saw change completely, and this is not only in the parliament that I have the, the privilege uh, and the honor and responsibility of leading, but also in the other institutions, you had prime ministers and heads of state saying, my people want me to go further on Ukraine. My people want Ukraine to become an EU member. And my people need to make sure that that mutual defense clause which you, which you um, mentioned uh, is not abandoned, especially in this period where there is a, a, a pot potential of further NATO expansion and further EU integration. Many questions are put to me, what's the timeline, uh, what's next? Let's not underestimate the transformative effect that also the pre-accession period can have on a country. Because programs start to be automatically available to pre-accession countries, candidate countries. When I um, look at what was done within days of the Russian invasion, which is Ukraine being connected to Europe's electricity market, and Ukraine also be connected to our digital market, in terms of roaming, etc. But also in terms of already a very wide-ranging trade agreement that we have with Ukraine, that should and will be built on. So we are not starting from scratch. The question of territorial integrity will always remain. The same question applies to other countries that are candidate countries. But rather than focus on which level of the garage you are parked in, if I can say that, <laughs> uh, I would like to say that we opened the doors last week when it might have been easier to close them. But there was no option for us. And I'm happy that the European Parliament was there already on the 1st of March saying grant Ukraine candidate status. There were uh, many who said, oh, no, don't do that, it's too early. I said, no, no, no. This is what the Ukrainians need right now. They have been invaded. We are all at the behest, some countries more than others, of a very menacing, threatening, um, unpredictable neighbor. Are we going to continue to look away from an energy geopolitical security point of view. As I said, the next months will be very challenging, but politically, we need to talk about that further integration. And if we do that, we will be sending the signal that the European Union is not only a group of economically interdependent states, but that those values underpin the decisions we take. And why do I also say that? Because we are seeing backsliding of those values also inside the European Union. 
and we make it so hard for countries to enter, and then once you enter, you can almost do anything. <laughs> And there are no tools. So this is also some of one part of the conversation that I would like to have uh, in the convention um, once it's triggered uh, on precisely where are the gaps, how we can fill them, and with the tools that we have, have we used them well or have we ignored them? Merci. Une autre question, le micro est là, il y a une question, là. ah non, vous êtes là, d'accord, on vous voit mal en fait, hein. <laughs> oui, yeah. allez-y, uh, je vous en prie. for filming reasons, I had to oui. move this way of the room. Um, I'm going to jump on what you just said. Um, so, Enricoletta mentioned before that we are finally engaging in a conversation about the idea of overcoming this dichotomy between a federation and a, and, a, and a European confederation and like accepting the complexity of the fact that maybe we need both uh, in order to welcome countries which are at different stages uh, that allow them to integrate the European project. At the same time, I'm asking myself, how are we gonna do this? Meaning like on both sides, for waiting countries, Ukraine first, how are we gonna sell them the fact that they're gonna be in a different waiting list, in a way, like a more welcoming and well, better labeled waiting list. While someone like Zelensky just said, we are not being filling thousands of pages of dossier just to be put in a waiting list while we're being bombed. We want to enter the EU and full stop. We're gonna enter the EU with all the benefits and the duties that come with that. So how are we gonna sell them the fact of being put in another uh, waiting room in a way and also to the other countries that have been waiting for quite a long time like now we're gonna build a new system and put them in a gray zone and on the other on the other hand like for countries who are already in the EU is that potentially gonna threaten furtherly the process of integration is that will that um, somehow unleash the idea of a more on a, on a Europe which is more like a menu à la carte thing, blocking, or maybe even uh, causing a backlash in the European integration for countries we're already in. Thank you very much. If you asked me this question four years ago, just after the Brexit referendum, I would have told you that I am seriously concerned that movements that are in favor of their countries exiting the European Union will grow. Today, I have no doubt that the opposite is true. Why? First of all, because we have seen what a mess it has been. And secondly, it's because there are no advantages. And it's being realized now. Enlargement processes have never been easy. It took 10 years for my country to join. And Zelensky has also mentioned the door being closed and candidates, countries being outside. I remember that door being physically closed. It was my job to be waiting outside to see whether we would be let in or not. And there was always this thing, yes, but, or one more thing you need to do, or uh, you have a problem in this case, in this case. And I remember my job as a young civil servant at the time was to say, oh, it's not us, sir. there's that country that's already inside the room that has a bigger problem than we have. Uh, when I don't think today, when you look back at what that moment meant for those 10 countries, so my country was one of them, on the 1st of May 2004, I don't think there is anybody who says that that was a mistake. I don't think there's anybody who says that the European Union is weaker today than it was then. If anything, I think it is much stronger. Is everything perfect? Of course not. Our countries, let's say, still far behind others, of course. i give you an example when we look at uh, the climate package that we voted on last week. In its implementation, there would be countries that can uh, implement the targets immediately, some countries that will never be able to, never. Uh, but that's also because the development level is, is slower. So I think that when we're talking about federation or confederation or different levels, there are always different levels. It's just that let's not make it an exclusionary process. Because there is no way that now that I and my country is in, and all my colleagues who joined on that day, 
that we now decide the European Union is full up. <laughs> this is not a, a numerous clausus kind of thing. This is an understanding of what Europe wants to do and where we want to go. Last week at the Western Balkan Summit, the president, president of Kosovo, came to the room and said, in this room, I am the only one from a country of 1.9 million people that needs a visa to come to Brussels. The only one. None of you have that. I, as president of a country, need a visa. We are not asking for candidate status. All we want is visa liberalization for 1.9 million individuals. We left the room with no response for that. And in fact, uh, what I'm concerned is that what could have been last week a very transformative summit for the Western Balkans uh, was not. I think we will, there will be movement on, uh, on North Macedonia and Albania and, and, uh, and um, Bosnia and Herzegovina to different levels. I'm also not a fan of packaging and understanding that different countries have different realities. And also I recognize the fact, and we all need to recognize, first of all, that Moldova was ready to, to answer all the questions in months rather than years that other countries have taken. And when I met uh, President Zelensky and, and, and his, uh, his um, uh, different ministers, and I told him, look, we need to go through the different steps. He said, don't worry, we will have the answers to the questionnaire and to, the, to everything in four days. They replied in two and a half weeks. Huh? And the European Union had to step up. And the European Union did step up in making sure that the response to the application was done at lightning speed. And the European Parliament also needed to step up to make sure that the decisions that had to be taken uh, at, at, uh, within our institution were taken much more quickly, even though sometimes, you know, we are, uh, we are uh, told that, ah, oh, you know, Parliament takes longer. Didn't take longer, because if you look at the European Parliament today, you will find quasi-unanimity on this issue. And that is, I can tell you, extremely difficult to find <laughs> in this Parliament. Uh, but I think that w rather than talk about terms, I would say how can we as people who are entrusted with the responsibility look at our counterparts, our colleagues, our brothers and sisters in the eyes and say, you can rely on us. This is how I conduct my job. When I, st I am at the table, I say, you can rely on me because I can deliver on this. On this, it will be more difficult. On this, it is your turn to deliver. And that is the conversation that we need to have. But what I don't want to see is countries, I give you an example, okay, well, I, I, going back to the Western Balkans, that have done everything. Some have even changed their name <laughs> in order for them to enter the European Union. And then they're told, sorry, not yet. So I think that we need to take a long and hard look about that. But if you see also how the sanctions packages were adopted, and yesterday the G7 called for further sanctions in relations to arms uh, and transport with Russia and in Russia, uh, I think that we are ready to take the next step as well. Steps that I didn't think would be possible in the past. So I would not necessarily think that this is going to make Europe weaker. If anything, I think those prime ministers around the table understand that they have no choice but to get closer together. Est-ce que vous êtes, euh, est-ce que vous êtes favorable? Henri Coletta nous parlait tout à l'heure d'une espèce de, de photo à 36. Est-ce que vous êtes favorable à ce qui est des, des accords très concrets? Il nous parlait d'Erasmus, par exemple. Est-ce que c'est des, des choses concrètes qu'on pourrait élargir? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that picture and understanding, but it has to have concrete outcomes, because I can tell you last, <laughs> last week, when at the end of the Western Balkan summit, to hear the prime ministers of the Western Balkans saying, you know, like we came and left with nothing is also very difficult. But the image and the commitment that we could have with access to horizon, 
the new Bauhaus projects, reconstruction, Erasmus, as you mentioned, roaming, digitalization, all these can be done within the accession process. And if we can give the leaders of those countries concrete steps, look, we are now here. Look, we are now going there. That's the next step. I think we can, we can very much send the best of messages. So I, I absolutely and fully agree with that. Merci. On va reprendre des questions dans la salle, mais on a aussi des gens qui nous suivent euh, sur Internet. Je vais, je vais juste relayer euh, quelques questions. Euh, Pensez-vous que l'Europe puisse devenir un leader dans la lutte contre le réchauffement climatique Le Green Deal européen lance beaucoup d'espoir, mais cela ne va pas assez vite pour la jeunesse. Et puis, il y a, a d'autres questions sur ce thème aussi. Euh, la ville de Grenoble a été élue capitale verte de l'Europe cette année. Que pensez-vous de l'efficacité de cette initiative européenne euh, délire des, des villes vertes et euh, avez-vous prévu d'aller à Grenoble prochainement <laughs> I love Grenoble but okay um, on the latter, latter um, point on the ville vert I, I, I forgot to mention one thing and this is also something that has been fantastic uh, over the past months and I give you one example I was in Strasbourg uh, So second week of March, we had a plenary session. So where we, when, when uh, we had the, the, the monthly um, uh, session in, uh, in Strasbourg and I met with the leadership of the, of the city and the region, uh, Klaus Feller, the Secretary General was there with me uh, and we were, and one of the um, persons in that room said, Look, I need to go because I have um, two big coaches coming of people who are from Ukraine and we need to find them lodging where they can live uh, uh, because they are arriving right now. And I said, where are they coming from? He said, well, they are coming from Ukraine. They have not slept in over three days. I said, are they going to stay in Strasbourg? He's like, no, 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 We are. they are going to Porto in Portugal. I said, but why Porto? He's like, because what this war has, has triggered is an absolute f um, um, mechanism of engagement and solidarity at the local and regional level. It was unbelievable what we have seen. The mayors and the local leaders have gotten together and identified because they are the ones on the ground. Uh, when I was in Florence, when we met with, uh, with um, Mayor Nardella, this was precisely what we were told. The mayors are on the ground saying, I can do this, I can do this, I can help out, I can help out. This continent has not seen that in decades. In decades. And this does not come from a law or a particular obligation, it comes from true show of solidarity. When I was on the, on the platform um, on waiting for the, the, the famous, now, now famous train to go to Kiev um, uh, in Poland, on the other side of the platform, there were hundreds of people, refugees still coming, it was still very early. And I asked, where are they going? And they told me, Czech Republic. This is a train going directly to Prague. And this is organized at the local level, not at the national level. So what we have seen in terms of leadership at the local level is absolutely unbelievable and amazing and truly European. Vilver, uh, I think we need to see more of that. I think uh, we had started with the EU investment, the Invest EU um, plan that was started with the Juncker Commission. It was called something else, I can't remember. Um, uh, and. Uh, There you could see which countries were going faster in terms of greening their cities. I remember some French cities were extremely um, uh, uh, leading in this, in this category. But in some countries, there was very little done. And as a result, we are in a position and we have taken very, very ambitious decisions uh, on the implementation of the climate laws last week on the on the emissions, uh, on carbon border management uh, um, adjustment mechanism, on the social climate fan fund, extremely important social pillar that will target the social and economic impact of climate uh, and on uh, small businesses particularly, that we have to realize that we have to help some countries more. 
uh, it will be much more difficult for some countries, especially those that have not invested enough in renewables. And this is why for the parliament, it is crucial that we advance the work on our legislative uh, activity on renewables, because we need to make sure that member states are given the equipment for them to transform where they get their energy from. And if this war has shown us something, where we are seeing coal plants being fired up again after decades of no, of no use, everywhere, it is now. Are we, being doing fa are we fast enough? No. Uh, from a technology perspective, we are lagging behind other continents, both the US and China. We still remain a leader in the creative industry, mm -hmm. but in everywhere else, we are losing our pace. And I think that every legislative initiative that we take has to also keep that in mind. How can we make Europe a leader? And as the questions that came in prove, in 2019, when we were um, elected together with my colleagues, we were asked to act on climate. We were asked, and we need to have something to show for it in 2024, when we face again our audiences that tell me, look, I want to know what you have done over the past five years. Can you show me what you have done? In some countries, we will have the same questions on migration, for example. Big debate. What have you done on migration? Have you moved? I can tell you so far, we have not. In the parliament, we are uh, identifying uh, certain landing zones, uh, but it's going to be difficult. So I'm acknowledging the challenges, also after two years of, of a pandemic, which meant that our legislative work needs to be picked up again. And it's going to be hard, but uh, we have the right, let's say, uh, momentum in the parliament that we will do it. So I, I, I end this very, let's say, uh, pessimistic answer with an optimistic word. Merci. On va prendre, euh, on va prendre une ou deux dernières questions. Oui. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so first, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Elisa Estienne, a part of uh, this marvelous adventure called uh, Academy Notre Europe uh, from l'Institut Jacques Delors. Uh, so as a quick reminder, you are the third woman after Anne Fontaine and Simone Veil. Uh, and I was wondering your thoughts about what is going on uh, in the United States about abortion. Thank you very much. Um, so Simone Veil was, was elected in 1979. Nicole Fontaine was elected in 99. And it takes 20 years every time for a woman to be elected president of the European Parliament. Uh, I hope that will not happen again. The first question I was asked, or maybe the second question I was asked after I got elected was, what is your position uh, on women's rights, and my answer was unequivocal. I stand for women's rights and equality everywhere. Position of the parliament is clear, and where there are regression of rights, then the parliament will fight that. We spoke about that uh, already last year in Poland. You see what happened. And what happened uh, last week uh, in the United States uh, I have already reacted myself as president of the parliament, but I have no doubt that next week in Strasbourg there will be the strongest of statements in that regard. That the regression of rights of women around the world is unacceptable and we will fight it. On a peut-être le temps pour la, la dernière question. Il y a beaucoup de mains. Ben oui, il n'y a qu'un seul micro. <rire> euh, a... Peut-être... Euh... Est-ce qu'il y a un deuxième micro Voilà, allez, la dernière question, allez-y. Bonjour. Euh, merci, Madame la Présidente. Et euh, j'ai mille et une questions à la suite de vos, de vos propos. I'll only, I'll only ask you two questions. I want to go back to the uh, presentation you gave, you gave. And you spoke of a new paradigm that the EU must now delve in. Uh, what priority issues do you reckon this new paradigm must uh, uh, um, include? Can we expect, and I want to go back to what's NATO been discussing, can we go back to, um, can we expect an, a review from the EU of its relationship with China, the way Germany's been engaged, um, the way Germany's been thinking about this already? 
And the, so what's our relationship with China? The second question has to do with the fact that we've seen recently that conservative forces abound, not just in the EU, but in the US. You've seen the results of the French election with the RN uh, winning, securing the highest number of seats ever. Uh, we've seen the power of Orban uh, in the negotiations in the sanctions package. Is there a spread of nationalism coming into the EU? And as part of this new paradigm that you've been discussing, that you've been presenting, can, how do we engage with new extreme right forces? Are they taking over the conservative right uh, that we've known for so long in the EU? Thank you. Long question. I think he collected everybody's questions and gave them to himself. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for, for this. Um, I think our biggest, let's, if we talk about what our main aim has to be, first of all, we have to restore peace on our continent. Uh, this is no longer just rhetoric, it's real today, because we have war on our continent. And peace does not come at any cost, it comes also with freedom and justice. And that means that the liberty that citizens of the European Union have, or people who live in Europe have, need to be guaranteed and protected everywhere. Uh, and that is why I said we can no longer take that for granted. Our climate challenges are huge, and we should not uh, underestimate populist forces in our union who claim that rising prices, etc., and all the challenges are due to the Green Deal. We started to hear this already in the autumn before the, the, um, the war. On who is in parliament and who is not. My answer is, look around you and see whether everybody around you voted or didn't. We have a too high abstention rate in elections in Europe. It's not the same in the US. This is the, 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 the results there that are being, that we are seeing are not as a result of abstention, but more polarization. But here, we have a big problem. Engaging, especially the younger voters, to turn up to vote. In 2024, four countries will even have 16-year-olds voting, different to last election, four countries. What do those young voters want? Are they frustrated? Do they think all politicians are the same? Do they think that no matter who is elected, the result will be the same? My job is to make sure that the answer to that is no way. I also think that because of the big challenges that we are going to be faced, facing, if we tap into that frustration and let's say citizen apathy, which is our fault, uh, we can answer the questions they want us to ask, to, uh, to, they want us to answer. There is a big challenge, especially between people who live in urban areas and rural areas. We see that across the European Union, so, and especially in the, in the geographically larger member states. We also see it in countries where you have systemic problems that have not been changed irrespective of who is in power. My second answer to that is we should counter the narrative. For many years we thought that the extremes will not grow if we ignored them. Not only have they not grown, but they're occupying vast parts of legislatures, which in some countries might paralyze decision making, or in some countries might take over decision making. So that's why the political forces in the center more than ever need to get together. The pro-European constructive center. And that means who has the answers to, the, to social and economic inequalities? Who can 
continue to ensure that growth in the economy is guaranteed? Who can ensure that protection is given by the state, but also that public finances are in balance? If we bring these fundamental principles of running a country together, then you can, you can build a constructive force in all countries in the center. But to do that, we need people to vote. And people to be convinced. That's my job, to convince. Uh, and it's not about a color, a political color or another. It's about understanding that if you place people who know how to negotiate across the table with other parties, with seriousness, with responsibility, I think we can manage. Climate needs to be at the very, very core. And the parts that I mentioned with peace at its, uh, as, the, as the thread across all the, all the policies could mean that we might look uh, at a shift away from the forces that you mentioned. Do I have all the answers? No, I don't. But I think that we need to work hard for that. The worst thing we could do is look away and think it will go away, because it will not. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Roberta Metzola. Merci beaucoup pour cet échange avec la salle. Alors, il y avait encore plein de questions. Je suis désolée, il y en avait aussi euh, sur Internet. On n'a pas pu tout prendre. Merci à vous euh, d'avoir partagé ce moment avec les jeunes de l'Académie Notre Europe. Euh, je... Oui. <rire> On vous remercie d'être venu, d'avoir partagé ce, ce moment avec les jeunes. Et euh, on va donc laisser maintenant la place aux jeunes, justement, 